Hi, okay, quickly, just before the video starts, I know I said I'd be uploading one video every week, but um, shut up, I've had deadlines in January, and also lockdown round three has really has really been doing a number on me mentally. Sorry I've not stuck exactly to the plan, but uh, hey, I'm still happy with myself, kind of, because I have been uploading way more than normal than I was even before the plan existed, so, you know, in my own head, I'm still gonna stick to the plan, because it makes me make more videos, even if in practice, it's not exactly to the plan. Does that make any sense? Hope so. Okay, also, I know I'm wearing a microphone in this video, but it didn't work, so the sound is not tip-top quality. Okay, cool, enjoy the video. Also, next video I'll be talking about Bridgerton, so tune in then. Okay, bye. Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. I'm Galatea, this is Asus, and today we're going to be talking about the books of 2020. <laughs> Asus is going to go here so he can watch and judge you all. Wow, what a year. What a, what, what a, what a, what a wonderful year 2020 has been. And now we're going to look back at all the, all the things that I read this year. So a couple of years ago, I did books, I think it was 2018, I think I did books of 2018 video. Quite a lot of people have been requesting that I do books of 2020 video. So that's what we're doing, because you guys asked for it. I have to say, I've got on this really ratty piece of paper, a list of everything that I read in 2020. And also, disclaimer, this is the important thing. These are the books that I read in 2020. These are not books that came out in 2020. So it's just things that I read this year. Okay, are we good to before I've Oh my God, no, these didn't come out in 2020. Yeah, that's not the point. You're in the wrong place. So just to say, just like my books of 2018 video, I did not read a whole lot this year. I listened to quite a lot of audiobooks. I listened to 36 audiobooks this year and I only read 15 books. I say that, if we want to be generous, we can say that I physically read 18, <laughs> maths, so good at it, 18 books, because I've, that was some of them are really big, that I'm part, almost all the way through, and that I was reading throughout the year, so like, I guess it's kind of more physical reading than 15. I find it quite difficult to read this year, that is in last year, as in 2020. I'm planning to read more for 2021, I'm, I'm gonna be really good. And read more. It's been a t 2020 has been a difficult year to keep focused on kind of anything really. I feel like I should have done a lot more reading because you know there was nothing else to do but I didn't. As with the 2018 this is gonna be um sort of like an award ceremony but not really. I think it's more interesting if I do what I did last time and if I just be like it's it's books being assigned to random categories. So to kick off this Books of 2020 video, I think we should just get, you know, right in there and start with the most effed up, I'm trying not to swear, YouTube doesn't like that, with the most effed up book that I read in 2020. <laughs> Prince of Thorns by Mark Lawrence. Within the first six pages, our protagonist um, has gang assaulted, I can't say the R word because YouTube doesn't like that word, but you know, it rhymes with grape. Um, he's gang assaulted two women and then killed them and burnt and massacred their whole village to the ground. Um, and he's 13 years old. So here's the thing, um, it's kind of hard to come back from that. Obviously he's meant to be kind of messed up and that's not necessarily a problem. The, the problem is I found is, okay, the fact that this character is the protagonist and it's from his point of view, I find it really hard to root for him, obviously the protagonist. As I was reading this book, I kept finding myself like thinking about how much more invested I would be in the story if he was the kind of protagonist I could root for. I kept thinking, it's, it's like good, it's not bad. Like I was enjoying it and the story is interesting um, and the world is interesting and I understand that he's beginning to be kind of messed up and I kept thinking, and this is like a totally personal preference, I just kept thinking if this kid, because he's a kid, had enough redeeming qualities that I cared about what happened to him, I wouldn't be so much more invested in the story. He was very smart and charismatic 
I have to say, the character in, in this book. But he would still, it was still not really enough to make me care about what happens to him. And you need, I think you need a bit of empathy for a character. Like, however bad they are, however, you know. I kept thinking how amazing he would be as the villain of the book, actually. He would be such a good villain. If this was kind of, from someone else's point of view, that you could root for more. And there was this kind of messed up child who's like really smart and charismatic and calculating as the villain. I, th I think, it, you know, with all his motivations and everything, he would make me an absolutely fantastic villain. I just didn't care about him enough as the hero. And I understand there's kind of a story kind of told from, I guess, a villain's point of view. I just find it hard to get invested in it. Having said that, I did enjoy the story and there's, I don't want to spoil it and say what kind of world this is. I actually, this was kind of ruined for me because I heard someone else talk about it, but there's a really cool aspect to the world um, and a really cool twist that when I sort of was discovered more about that and found that happens quite a way through the book and when I sort of discovered more about that I was actually became really interested and really invested and to be fair sort of by the end of the book you do start to understand the character more and root for him more but it was it's really it. like I said from what happens in the first six pages it's hard to come back from that it's I would recommend it though if you're I'd recommend not to everyone, it's very specific taste, I guess. If you like this kind of thing, I would recommend it. I enjoyed it, it's interesting. Because I didn't connect with the main character enough, it kind of put me off picking up the second and, you know, the other books in the series. I do want to eventually, but I feel like if I'd cared about the character more, I would have read read the series already by now because I did enjoy the other aspects of it. And I understand he's meant to be an anti, well, not even an anti hero, he's just a full-on villain. I understand that. But for me personally, it, I just found it so difficult to root for him because he's just so awful. The prize for, um, I knew it would be bad, so why do I keep reading Nora Roberts and expecting different? Goes to Sanctuary by Nora Roberts. with me because I listened to it on audiobook. I listened to it on this like, like an app thing where pay a tiny amount a month and then there's loads of free books on there that you can just read. So if I'd had to like specifically pay for this book I wouldn't have read it because I've never really been impressed with a Nora Roberts book. I always do this. I'll be like I've read a few Nora Roberts. And then I'll like read the synopsis of her of one of her books and it will sound really interesting. I'll be like, oh, because it's free and I can just listen to it as I'm doing other stuff, I'll just listen to it. And I always expect for some reason that it's gonna be better than than all the other books that I've listened to by her. And it's always disappointing. It's always like, wow. Here's the thing. Her books, I just find them, you know, there's always a romance, and there's quite often like a mystery or like a murder or like something going on. And I find the characters really bland. The romance is always really boring and bland, and it's not like and there's no chemistry between anyone, I think, and I'm just kind of bored reading it, and the mystery is also just kind of boring. I need to just stop listening to them, even though they're free, because I'm always, like, getting kind of annoyed, because I'm like, oh, it's snowing! Sorry, it's just it's snowing outside. That's so exciting. I wish it had snowed at Christmas. Oh, well. Happy January! I remember now what it was about Sanctuary that I didn't like. No, this really wound me up. What really annoyed me was there were, th I think there were three. It felt really gratuitous. There were three... R-A-P-E scenes, but it wasn't, and I don't have a problem with scenes like that if they're kind of necessary, if they're important to the plot, but it wasn't, it was just, you could, it could, that, those things could have happened without us having, it felt really gratuitous. There were three of those, I think there were three, there were at least definitely two, or there was like maybe flashbacks to a third one. It was like really in detail, which was, I really don't, I mean, I don't think many people like reading stuff like that in really explicit detail that it's uncomfortable, it's not nice, but I can understand if it's necessary to the story, you know, sometimes it should make you feel uncomfortable and whatever, but it, it didn't feel like, it, you could have, it was so unnecessary because that's it, the characters, it was from like their point of view as these women were experiencing this but then the these these women like died straight after so i would understand if if the female character who this happened to then went on to live and you got from her point of view there would be a purpose to having the scene in detail and to being in her head when it happened because obviously then it's her character that you know what i mean there's then a purpose to experiencing that event with her but because of these women that it happened to like that happened to them and then they were murdered immediately afterwards, it kind of felt a little bit unnecessary. It's like, why do we have to experience what they're experiencing in such detail, in a really icky, gratuitous way, when they are then just like gone from the story, so there's no purpose to it because why do we need to, you know, it could have just been 
said that that happened to them or you know in another or not in detail it felt gratuitous and i really didn't like it i kind of felt like i needed a shower so the prize for stealthily tragic as in it's actually a really sad story but you don't actually notice it because the tone of the book isn't as tragic as actually what happens is <laughs> The Homeward Bounders by Diana Wynne-Jones. First of all, Diana Wynne-Jones is one of my favourite writers of all time. You guys are always asking for recommendations. Anything by Diana Wynne-Jones. However, this was, this was interesting, it was good, but I would say it's one of her least good books. It still wasn't bad because it's Diana Wynne-Jones and she's amazing, but it was by no means, not by a long way, my favourite of her books. I'd recommend, if you want good Dino and Jones books, Dog's Body, Fire and Hemlock, Howl's Moving Castle, Charmed Life, start with those. It was, it was enjoyable, I enjoyed it, and I can't really say much without spoilers, and it's like, it's like a children's adventure story, but there's like aspects to it that are like, kind of really, really f***ing sad. If you like Dino and Jones, I'd recommend reading it, because you probably would enjoy this anyway, even though it's not one of her best books. It's still enjoyable, I thought, and a really interesting idea. That's what I, that's what I love about Dino and Jones. Her children's stories just have the most batty, wonderful, random ideas. And I think she's one of the... This is kind of irrelevant because this is off topic for books I've read this year, but just in terms of authors I like, Diana Wynne-Jones I think is one of the most original authors that I've ever read. Um, it's definitely in children's literature. She doesn't copy anyone, she doesn't... It's just like, how does she think of this? This is just so random, but amazing. Anyway, I will stop ranting about her, but I think she's just wonderful. The next award is, I don't really know how to feel about it. Is it good? Is it bad? I don't know. That prize goes to The Wheel of Time. This one I listened to on audiobook, like I listen to a lot of books this year on audiobook. I've read, how many? The Wheel of Time is a massive series and I'm currently on, I've read a Crown of Swords from The Wheel of Time, which is book seven. So it's quite a lot. I don't know how to feel about The Wheel of Time. I will say right up front, outright, that if I had been physically reading these books rather than listening to them, I would not have got even through the first book, I don't think. I did not find it compelling enough or interesting enough. I, even if I had finished the first book, you know, cause you gotta give it to, even if I had gotten read, physically read and gotten to the end of the first book, I would not be compelled enough to pick up the second book or any beyond that. It is interesting enough that when I'm listening to it and doing other stuff, I'm kind of interested and I like listening to it, but I, I, would, I wouldn't I would like physically read them. I've heard things from The Wheel of Time that the world building's really good and everything. I mean, I'm not sure I'd agree with that. It's okay. The characters in general are okay. I did not think they, for me, they, for me, they did not leap off the page. They weren't like terrible cardboard cutouts either. Like they were definitely, you know, characterized, well character, characterized, but I just, they didn't feel that real to me. Um, especially Rand, the main character. I thought he was bland Rand. That's what I call him because I thought he was bland. Sorry, he was just meh. He was a bit boring. Bit of a wet lettuce. Bit of a wet flannel. Bland Rand. The other characters were fine. My favorite character was Matt. I liked him. I thought he was, he's a good character. He's, he's, I think he's the most interesting actually. The story, the story's fine, it's okay, it's kind of interesting enough. Again, I just, the, the, I just didn't find, I'm just like, I don't really know how to feel about it because it wasn't terrible, but it's also not really good. It's just, I didn't, like, I don't think it's outstanding. But having said that, I can see why some people perhaps do because it's clearly, you know, a complex world. There's a lot of work gone into it, a lot of effort into it. It's a massive, you know, series certain elements that you know the, there's there's clearly a lot of thought and energy and heart gone into it i think i don't want to say it's masterful because i didn't really find it masterful but i can see how some people would think it was and maybe there were elements to it that are masterful i don't know it's like i don't know how to feel about it because there are also some things to it that i'm like i just think this is badly done and but i would not read it physically and i'm probably going to finish the series because i'm interested enough to know what happens that's the other thing as well about the word of time just to quickly add in there thing that really annoyed me i thought the character relationships were terrible that i thought they were so bad the chemistry between the characters, thought it was bad. 
um, just randomly, like, characters would feel one way about someone, and then, like, with a no warning, suddenly their whole feelings towards someone has, like, changed, com like, completely, out of no- like, I mean, when I say out of nowhere, I mean, like, they wake up one morning, and f it's suddenly, like, what, they do, like, a U-turn, and they, some like, feel the complete opposite about someone, like, romantically and otherwise, like, it's just, thing. people get together out of nowhere, people decide they're not interested in each other out of nowhere, it's just so weird, they just feel like whiplash, I'm like, what, what? But like it's not in a, like an exciting way when it's like oh that came out of nowhere that's so interesting but like you know where you could sort of sense it it was just like I just feel like there was no like build up no chemistry between any of the characters really because I didn't feel like the characters were that they didn't feel that alive for me perhaps that is why I think that's why I've nailed it that I think is why the characters felt not as real as they could because the relationships were so bad and I feel like if their relationships had been built up more the characters themselves would feel more real because their characterization wasn't that bad it was kind of pretty good in a lot of ways but i think because the dynamics between the characters were so bad it leaves the characters themselves feeling flat the award for the best atmosphere as in it really made me feel like i was there living it check the mic and make sure it sound right boy I've never seen the movie, but I have heard that the movie is like nothing like the book. It's about, so he's the last man on earth. He's the only survivor of like a plague that's basically made everyone else on the planet bloodthirsty, basically vampires. And I really felt like I was there. It's from his, it's in, you know, you're in his head as you're reading this story. He's the last man, everyone else is a vampire. He's completely alone, no other living thing in this house that he has to sort of board up every night to protect himself and he's just been living on his own for months. I felt like I was there. I really felt the isolation and the loneliness. <laughs> I mean, I did read it in 2020 as well, so talk about isolation. Even without that, I've really felt the isolation and the loneliness and the complete psychological turmoil that this man was going through. And it was horrible. <laughs> it was really depressing, so depressing to read, but it was good and it was gripping. I was very, the end I think let it down a bit, but for most of it, I was really gripped. But I thought it was the best atmosphere of making me really feel like I was there. The loneliness was crushing. It was horrible. Probably shouldn't have read it this year. Didn't help anything, but you know, it's a good book. Okay, so now the prize for the coolest idea with the worst execution goes to, is this any surprise to anyone? Drum roll. Society by Zoella, also known as Zoe Sugg, the YouTuber. I did a video a couple of months ago on the Magpie Society by Zoella and I did not like it and I thought it was not good. The idea behind it is good, like I said in the video. Was the, this, this is the, why it gets the prize for the coolest idea but the worst execution because the story itself was boring. And I can't remember all my criticisms of it but I did do a whole video on it which I'll link if you want to watch that of when I talk in depth about it. I don't need to say any more because I said a whole video on it. That's all, moving on. The award for the most bizarre book I read this year. Lanny by Max Porter. It's a really pretty cover, can you see it? It's like gold and shiny. This wasn't a bad book, it was good. But I just don't know, I don't know how much I liked it. I kind of enjoyed it, but it's just kind of, it's very strange because it's a really strange, it's one of those books that's got a really like strange narrative structure. I, d I really liked the idea behind it as well. I did, did enjoy, there were a lot of aspects of this book I really enjoyed. And um, there's like a thing in the woods, sleeping in the woods called Dead Papa Toothwort. It's kind of quite po like almost like poetic and like with really weird prose, which if you like that kind of thing, definitely read it. Um, yeah, it, but it was just very strange. Next on the list, we have the award for the most beautiful slash the purest story. A Company of Swans by Eva Ibotson or Ibotson, I don't know, people go, it's Ibotson, it's Ibotson. I don't know, but I always said when I, since I was a kid I read it as Everett Botson, so I'm just kind of stuck on saying that now. So A Company of Swans, this is a reread, and I think it's maybe the third time I've read it because I love Everett Ibotson. I love her books. I think she writes, like the way she writes, it's so poetic and so beautiful. Um, I did a whole video on her books called like the best romance writer. Um, I think her romances are really beautiful. They're not like angsty, 
Well, maybe a bit angsty, but not like in an angsty way. That made no sense, but if you read them, you kind of know what I mean. Like maybe they were a bit angsty, but not like in an angsty way. Again, makes no sense. <laughs> read them and you'll see what I mean. I think this is one of my favorites of her books, um, A Company of Swans. It's set, I think it's like set in like 19, why do I think 1911? 1912! Oh my goodness, I'm so spot on. Um, almost. Okay, so set in 1912. So Harriet is the daughter of a Cambridge professor, and she's raised by him and, and his sister, her aunt. Um, her mother's dead. She's quite neglected at home, her father and her aunt don't really care that much about her. They're not very feeling people, they're just really cold, and she's a very, like, feeling person. Um, she loves ballet, and then she gets the chance to join... Yeah, she's kind of engaged to this man that her father really approves of. I think there's a lecturer at Cambridge. University and she just doesn't really like him. So she, um, she gets the chance to join a traveling ballet company and perform in, you know, go to the Amazon and perform at the Grand Opera House in the jungle. And so she basically runs away from home and to, to dance on the stage, be, be a ballet dancer. And when she's out there, of course, because there's romance, she, yeah, she meets someone I won't really say very much. But it's just, I just, it's so beautiful. I think it's so, like, sweet and pure. And Harriet as a character, she's just so, such a, like, a good, sweet person. I'm um, very timid. But, yeah, I just, I just, I just loved it. And the most beautiful, the purest story. And it's, it is a reread. I've read it many times before. Um, but I just love Emma Watson. And if you want something, if you want something uplifting, something beautiful and pure, lovely story... Um, and a romance as well, then, or if you like ballet, it would be interesting if like that, then, um, and it's kind of funny, it's just, everybody is a very funny writer, so, yeah, I would suggest A Company of Swans. Okay, so now the award for, and this is going to be confusing when I first say the award, but I will explain what I mean by it, the award for the most unfinished story goes to... <laughs> American Royals by... I didn't write down who it's by, it doesn't really matter. Um, and this goes to both books in the series, I'm pretty sure it's a duology. It goes to American Royals and Majesty. Both, both of those books in the series get the prize for the most unfinished story. Now, what do I mean by that? This award is most unfinished because it is unfinished in two ways. Number one, it felt like a really early finish that I was really when I finished the story and was like this is only a duology it feels like there should be another book because so many things were left hanging or like resolved really quickly like but not resolved there were there were so many things that were set up and there was no payoff so I'm just like really that's it and secondly it was unfinished in like the whole story throughout it was lacking key relationships it felt like a like a draft of a story or a sketch of a story like like you know if, if this story was a painting someone's just taking a, a rubber or i know what that means in america and that means a razor in america but i refuse to use your words i'm using rubber because that doesn't mean what it means for you for with for us it means a razor but it's like someone's just taken a rubber and rubbed out massive chunks <laughs> of this of this painting and it's like a painting and then there's just bits that are like blanks bits missing and you're like so that was the like overall story so basically american royals what is it about well it's if history had changed and george washington had become the first king of america and if though and it's set in the modern day but if america had a monarchy so it follows the washingtons like the washington royal family and if the, the several characters the, the three there are three children so you've got Princess Beatrice, who is the heir to the throne, because it's the first generation that a woman, woman will be allowed to sit on the throne if she's the firstborn, so she's the oldest, follows Princess Beatrice, and then her younger siblings, who are twins, Samantha and Jefferson, and it follows them and sort of their friends and people around them, mainly their love lives. It's like one of those stories that kind of pretends to be another story and about politics, but really it's about romance, you know, which I feel like, no disrespect, maybe a bit of disrespect, but that is what a lot of YA is like. It like it like it um, stealthily, you know, it disguises itself as one genre. But really, it's romance. It really is. All of them are. They pretend that they're not, but they're really romance. You know that they are. They're like stealthy romance. They're camouflage romance. Oh, I'm fantasy. No, you're not. You're romance. Not just romance. Angsty romance. Oh, I'm a mystery. No, you're still romance. Oh, I'm political intrigue, alternative parallel history. No. Still romance. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, that's my little right. No, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes it is. In this case, yeah. So, okay, so it follows them. And one of the things that really annoyed me, one of the things that made this 
these this series feel unfinished this annoyed me so much it annoyed me all the way through the first book and as i was i was again listening to an audiobook because i wouldn't I wouldn't have read these physically. This was like, I need something sort of entertaining and lighthearted to read. Oh, this is kind of intriguing. I'll listen to this as I clean. It was that kind of vibe. Um, and it was interesting enough that I listened to the second book. I was disappointed though, the second book and how it ends, like I said, so badly. One thing that annoyed me so much, and I'm almost certain this is true because I was watching out for this because I noticed it near the beginning of the first book i noticed it and then i was watching for it throughout the whole rest of the second oh, the whole rest of the first book and the whole of the second book i was paying attention to this beatrice the princess the heir and her younger brother jefferson uh, the, yeah, and the prince they did not have a single scene together in the whole duology I'm not kidding you. And maybe if someone's got, oh no, they did. There was this random scene here or there was this scene here. If they did, then it was like one scene that were like easily overlooked and missed because I was watching out for this. I'm almost certain that the whole duology, they did not have one, they, they did not even like come into contact with each other. Like, I kid you not. Maybe there was a scene where they were like in the room together at the same time, but they never interacted. They never interacted throughout this whole duology. And it, I was going crazy. I'm like, they are siblings. The whole story is about their family and their family dynamics. They, 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 they live to, they live in whatever this world's version of the White House is together and they do never interact. They don't even ever think about each other. Like, because it's from their, you know, it's from very different characters' points of view. When it's from Beatrice's point of view, she never, like, maybe a passing thought about her brother. And same for him. It's like, it's like they're in different stories and they don't know each other exists. And all the other characters know both of them and know that they exist. And their sister, Samantha, like, interacts with both of, both of them, her brother and her sister. But Beatrice and Jefferson, like, it's like they're in, they, they don't know each other exists. Like, they're on parallel worlds that p other people cross between, but they're just, like, living in separate universes. It's so weird. And it annoyed me so much. I became so frustrated because I'm like, it felt so weird. It really took me out of the story. Like, I was like, this is so, like, what's the point? Why are they even in the same fact? Like, it just was so annoying. And also, this other thing kind of annoyed me as well. And this is a kind of a spoiler. If you want to read this, maybe like skip until, you know, this bit's over. So, you know, at the beginning of obviously the beginning of the duology, you have sort of, it's always, you know, beginning of the duology, everything's set up. And, you know, the people that it's implied that everyone's going to end up with, it's all seeded and set up, right? And this is what I mean when I say there was no payoff. No one ended up with, like romantically, no one romantically ended up with the person that it was set up that they were gonna end up with, if that makes sense. Like no one, it would have been okay, like if that happened to like one person or a couple of people, but it like, it happened to everyone. Literally no one ended up with the person that it was set up from the beginning that they were gonna be interested in or end up with, which I found so weird. And normally I quite like it when someone, you ha they have a relationship and it's changed and they break up, whatever. But in this book, in this book, it just felt so weird. They just randomly got with someone else in a way that felt like the author had literally changed her mind after the first book. She was just like, oh no, I've changed my mind now. Um, I don't like how I set it up. I'm gonna, this is gonna happen now. I got bored of these. Like if it didn't feel like it was natural. It just felt like she was like, ah, no, I'm bored, I'm bored of who I decided, who I initially wanted them to end up with. Now I'm bored of that. Here's a new idea. And also there was and another kind of spoiler. There was no payoff with the villain's evil plot. So one of the villains, you know, villains always have an evil plot plot. Like no one even found out that this person had an evil plot. Nothing happened with it. It was like, so this villain kind of like got away with it. And that's not necessarily a bad thing that, you know, people sometimes get away with stuff, but they didn't get away with it in a way that was interesting. It was just like, like as if it was forgotten about. And as if this villain who had this whole evil plan, just sort of like carried out the, you know, it was set up from the beginning. You the whole way through you're reading the books. You're like, I can't wait. That's why it was annoying. Cause the whole way through you're reading the books and like, oh, I can't wait until everyone finds out what a little snake this girl is. She's awful. She's horrible. She's got all these plans in place. I cannot wait until like, until the guy she's tricking finds out about it, you know? So you're, that's what's promised you at the beginning and you're waiting for the payoff and you're like, oh my God, I can't wait until everyone finds out. She's like screwed everyone over. She's ruined people's lives. She's broken people up. Oh my God, I cannot wait until everyone finds out. And they never do. And then it just ends. There was like no payoff for anything, but it happened with everything, with romances, with like relationships, with plot lines. There was set up and there was no payoff. It just was like crumbled to dust. And that's why I'm really, I'm gonna research this again because I heard that it was only duology. I'm pretty sure I read something where the author was like, nah, that's it. But if so, why? Like that could have been like a good ending to a second book, but everything's left like in disarray. And you're like, oh my God, everyone's with different people and what's going on? And then you bring it back round and tie it all in and pay everything off in the last book. But what the hell, dude? The Sweet 
Far Thing by Libba Bray. This is, and I'm almost finished. I'm literally, okay. So this series, it's the series of A, a Great and Terrible Beauty. There's it's a trilogy. Um, and this is the last book in the trilogy. I read the whole trilogy this year, bar this, bar the last like few chapters. I stopped reading this in like October. It's a kind of series, like it's, it, the idea's interesting and it started off promising and I was hoping, the first book was okay. I was interested in the ending. I think, I think I was, and I was like, oh, I can't, I feel like this might be the kind of series that gets better with the other books. And it hasn't, it's gotten worse. And I, this is, okay, I think this says, for me anyway, how bad this was at keeping my attention. It's a trilogy. I'm that close to the end of it, to finding out what happens to all the characters. I only have this much left to read, and I just don't care. I just don't care. So I read a whole trilogy, and I'm that close to the end. And like, I was interested in what happened to the characters. I really wanted to know what happened, you know, in the first book and the second book. But this book, I was just, like, I'm just, it just managed to so spectacularly lose my interest that I'm like this far from the end and I just don't really care anymore what happens to anyone. And I don't know if I'll finish it. I feel like I should, just cause you know, the whole series overall, would I recommend it to someone? Unless you read, hear the idea of it and think, oh my God, that sounds amazing, I have to read it. Um, no, I wouldn't recommend it because it's just a bit boring, the whole series, I think. It's a bit dull, sorry. So these are the Underwater Awards because for some reason as I was putting all these books of 2020 together I realised that I'd read quite a few books that were magical and somehow involved the ocean and I thought they were all great, I think I enjoyed, I enjoyed them all, yeah all of them, I said I, read, I enjoyed them all. So the, first of all we have the prize for um, the best representation of a mermaid that I've ever read. That I've ever read, oh my god it is that I've ever read. So we've got a runner up, I don't know if this runner up counts as, the winner counts as the best representation of a mermaid I've ever read, but this one counts, this, the runner-up is not, it, hmm, it's, I think it's even the second best representation, it's like, it's, a, okay, this, this one gets an award for a good representation of a mermaid, one of the best, there we go, one of the best representations of a mermaid I've ever read goes to The Mermaid by Christina Henry. So she does sort of like fairy tale-ish retellings. I liked her book Lost Boy, which is a weird, dark retelling of Peter Pan. Well, not really retelling. It's like a, it's sort of about yeah, Lost Boy. It's about that world, and I, I that's my favourite of hers. It's still my favourite of hers that I've read. The Mermaid was good. It was interesting. I thought that this representation of the Mermaid was very good. I ha I hate. I've got a real pet peeve when I read stories about mermaids and they're really cheesy. It winds me up so much. I'm like, no, okay. For me, I love when a mermaid is like, when she comes on land, she's mystical and slightly strange and doesn't quite fit in the world. And there's something so compelling and but odd about her. Like, and that was this. Yeah, so basically it's about a mermaid who is a fisherman who lives by himself on a, as it says, a cold and rocky coast. One evening he catches a mermaid in his net and yeah, I guess they sort of fall in love. But there's a lot more to the story that goes on from there. So she lives with him for many years um, and rumours of this beautiful, strange woman sort of spread and then this this guy hears it. Sort of a con man slash businessman who's in the business of, you know, the curiosities, of curious things, of, you know, selling tickets to people to come and see strange things. And he hears rumours of, of this mermaid. Interesting story, good, but she was, I really liked that representation of a mermaid. I thought it was really cool and really interesting. That's what, that's what I hate, when when representations of mermaids are really cheesy and like weird. What I hated, and I think it was by, is it what she called, Kira Cass? And um, this is off the top of my head, I think that's her name. She, same one who wrote the Selection series, which I've never read because I have no interest in it and it looks terrible, sorry, no offence if you love it. The same one who, person who wrote that, she wrote this series called The Siren, or Siren or something, that I read a few years ago. And it was so bad. And that's probably the worst representation of mermaid slash sirens I've ever read. It was so cheesy, so awful, so like not magical, so like, you know what I also don't like? You know, like, um, reminds you of like H2O, Just Add Water, like whatever that show was. I don't think I ever saw it, but I've seen like clips or trailers from it. I think I knew of it when I was a kid. And even as a kid, I was like, no, I hate that. You know, like the kind of we're cool teenage girls who are mermaids. It's like you've taken all the magic out of it. I'm not saying mermaids can't be teenage girls, that's fine, but you know when it's like, 
oh my god, mermaid powers. You know what I mean when it's like really that kind of, there's nothing otherworldly about it. So I like that again, oh my god, going so off topic. She was otherworldly and mysterious and beautiful and strange. She was strange, is the key thing. And I thought that was cool. The Mermaid and Mrs. Hancock. The book itself, so it's sort of about, it's kind of weird, it's like set in 1785 um, and it follows a merchant whose ships come in and they've, his captain says he sold his ship for a mermaid and it's sort, of, it's, it's sort of historical involving all these people and it's kind of, I don't know how to feel about the story overall, it's kind of a weird story where I didn't really feel like, I mean I guess that's kind of the point of the story but I didn't really feel like there was much of a plot, it's definitely not really plot driven, it's kind of a bit strange, but we're not talking about that. What we are talking about is that the representation of the mermaid, the best. So, and this is kind of mild spoiler, so if you really don't want to hear anything about the mermaid, maybe click away if you're planning to read this book, but otherwise I will say, so the descriptions, the mermaid in the book, it's just this tub of water, and if, at first it's just it's like, like there's water, there's nothing there, and it's like, th this is the mermaid or whatever, but people kind of can't stay away from it, from this water, from, from the mermaid. And then people spending more and more time by the water, by and feeling longing and sad, and it's kind of messing with their heads and their emotions, and they're so longing for it and wasting away by it. And the, it's got from the perspective of quote unquote the mermaid as well, where it's like it's a, like a really completely. And that's what I say when I say I love mermaids are otherworldly creatures. This is one of the most otherworldly. It's just it's almost like a consciousness rather than anything else. The mermaid sort of thinking about the ocean and all. it's so beautiful the description, the longing for that and it talks in we and that there's like a collective, almost like a shoal of fish. Um, it's kind of creepy but also really kind of beautiful. I don't know how to explain it, you kind of have to read it probably but uh, I mean the story itself is, is, it was okay, I enjoyed it well enough. There were some random things in it that didn't really go anywhere but but yeah, anyway, that's what we're talking about. The prize for the best mermaid ever. I thought it was really beautiful description and it's so well summed up and encapsulated that otherworldliness that I love that I, you know, if that's my, I think, if you're gonna write about mermaids, I think, <laughs> only my opinion, but I think they should be like that. So otherworldly, so like unknowable. Almost like the ocean themselves, they, they should be like as unknowable as the ocean, as strange and unpredictable and just like nothing you could ever understand, just like the ocean is. And that I feel like that's what this mermaid was. And I thought it was really beautiful. And there's so many beautiful. If you want to, if you if you love like reading, if you're not too bothered about plot and love reading about beautiful descriptions, beautiful places like stuff, then then read this book because I think you probably like it. The best monsters. Deep Light. Overall, I enjoyed the story, but what I really loved was I thought the idea for the monsters was really cool. And I can't remember how much to say without giving the story away, because it was a whole year ago that I listened to it. It's sort of, I think this is said from the get-go, it's like set near the ocean, and um, there's this main character who's this young boy, it's a children's story. There's like, there used to be the ancient gods, the gods of the ocean, that would rise up. Oh, and that's it, that's it, that's what I remember. There's like, the under ocean, or what, I can't remember what they call it but beneath the real ocean, once you get to the bottom of the real ocean, the ocean beneath the ocean, that's where the monsters live. And that's really dangerous, pla I think there's that really dangerous place to go into or humans don't go in there or something. But it's just really, it's like a second ocean within. There's like a different kind of water and a different, I don't know how to explain it. Um, and that's where the, the gods came from, the monsters came from. And that's really dangerous and it's all, it's just, it's quite a good story. So if you like children's stories, if you like fantasy, if you like that kind of stuff, This is my favourite read of the year. Not necessarily the best if I'm being really analytical, but even then it's a strong contender. This is just my personal take, my favourite book of the year. The Scorpio Races by Maggie Stiebarter. Okay, so this story, it's set on a fictional island, which could sort of be one of the little islands that are off, off the coast of Scotland, or, you know, somewhere like that is kind of the vibe. A really rural, isolated island, it's set there, 
and it's set in kind of it's never really explicitly stated a time but it kind of feels like modern day although you know it could be there's nothing to date it so it could sort of be from how people act it could sort of be anywhere from like i guess the 80s even the 70s up till now it's kind of got that timeless feel to it where that you know they've got cars and radios and blah blah but nothing else is really mentioned there's no reference to technology or anything like that really it feels very real i thought though the world and it's set so this fictional island where there are really dangerous water horses that come out and every year basically they have what they call the Scorpio races where the islanders will ride water horses and race them along the beach and it's a really dangerous race because water horses obviously if you know from mythology they like dragging people down to the depths of the ocean eating them and tearing them apart so it's a it's a really dangerous race and people die from it quite frequently um, and the main characters it follows Puck and the other character it follows is Sean feel like it might be Sean and him and he has raced in the race every year and Puck's never raced in it before and she decides to sort of join the race and I feel like I'm not doing the story justice because it's so good and so interesting the world is so rich and beautiful the characters are so cool um it just feels so real it's like almost feel like kind of magical realism thing where it's so convincing like it feels so much like the real world and then it's just taken for granted that there are these magical water horses these beings that you know they catch every year and that they race and that they're really date they're always wild and they always yearn for the sea and you know they kind of tear people apart quite often and it is just a really lovely beautiful story and furthermore i just want to say as well maggie steve is one of my again one of my favorite writers ever i read her series the raven cycle i recommend it to yeah everyone i think she's amazingly talented i love her stories i love her characters yeah read the scorpio races or you know the raven boys her series on that she's one of she's one of the what, she's one of the only young adult writers that I really, really enjoy um, the books of and think are really well crafted in like just an amazing way. And I'm not saying, look, I love children's books. I think children's literature is generally like amazing. You get so many good children's authors. I just, I, there's something about YA. I feel like, I think it's because it's easy to kind of market to teenagers. Um, and I feel like people that, I feel like a lot of writers focus more on the romance, as I said earlier, and the sort of angst of it rather than the story not all of them i don't want to paint everyone with that brush but that can sometimes i think hamper the genre in general of ya and if you enjoy ya that's fine i'm just saying my sort of take on it my opinion of it i don't think the stories in general are as good a quality as children's literature and because i i love children's literature and that's my opinion on it i will say the, and i'm saying that just to say that maggie steve Arda's books are so fantastic and wonderful and beautiful um, and they are they do involve romances as well Um, but I think she's just, they're so well crafted in such a, and this is my opinion, so don't get mad at me, I'm not saying, I'm not hating on you if you like YA, that's fine, but in my opinion, um, her books are rare in terms of they're well crafted in a way that I personally don't see in most young adult literature, and I've read quite a lot of young adult literature, if you disagree with me that's fine, but me personally, a lot of YA stuff I don't think is that well crafted, uh, but Maggie Steve Adders definitely is, and I'm not saying she's the only good YA writer. There are, are good young adult books out there. My personal take on it, okay? So yeah, the best book of the year goes to The Scorpio Races for being mythical and strange and really about the ocean and ah, it, I, it's just such a good world. I think it might even win best world as well, best world building, best characters, best romance, like the very sweet, this, you know, just so much about it. Characters, I really loved it and I love Maggie Steve books in general and that's what I'm gonna end the video on. So I hope you all enjoyed this video. Um, thank you very much for watching me just randomly categorise some of the books I've read this year into really random weird categories. But um, you guys wanted to see this video, so I hope you enjoyed it. I'm gonna say thank you to Asus for being so good at his job, which is hosting. He doesn't talk, because then I'd have to pay him. So, one day. I wish you all the best for 2021. Come on guys, collectively, we're gonna make we're gonna make 2021 a really good year. We are, we are. Don't be like that. Come on. Somehow, I have faith, I have faith. I'm, I'm jinxing it, aren't I? No, touch wood, I'm touching wood, so it's okay. I have faith that 2021 is gonna be better than 2020 has been. Touch wood. Regardless, regardless of how this year turns out, I wish you all the best for 2021. Good wishes to you all. Happy New Year. 
Oh, follow me on Instagram if you want. I'm posting more often now. I post all my artwork and stuff if you want to follow me on that, which you can. You can also follow me on Twitter, though I'm, I, I don't go on Twitter, so you can, but it's pointless. But you can follow me on Instagram. More active on Instagram. So anyway, thank you everyone very much for watching. Happy New Year. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you have any recommendations of things you want me to do videos on, then you can recommend them down below. I might not listen to you. Is there anything else I need to say? I don't think so. Thank you very much for watching and goodbye.